Good morning, everyone. <laughs> My name's Scott Geffert. I'm from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And uh, next to me is Susan Farnan from RIT. And, uh, and our other speaker is Robert Buckley, um, who's representing the CIE study. And he's actually probably on a plane right now to a faraway place. So we have him, as uh, happened yesterday, via a pre-recorded segment. But I felt it was important to sort of incorporate all of these voices in this presentation. We have a, this is a long slog. This is probably the longest format that I've ever spoken in. So, uh, you know, if we need to stretch in between the presentation of the study findings, um, we'll do that. But um, I've tried to keep things as concise as possible. So let's dive right in. Um, what color is a Monet on Mars? This often comes up, you know, why we bother making these paintings color correct in the first place. And it's interesting because what brought up that slide was the idea that the Mars rover, without those color charts, we really wouldn't know what's going on up there. Um, and, and this ties to me the, the importance of color management. Now, if that Martian came down to Earth and went on the internet and searched for that same painting, this is what they would see today. Um, so it shows, I think, that we have a lot to do. And I know these aren't all of our great captures. They're pictures from books, et cetera. But uh, in a way, the museum, I think, needs to be the authoritative source for the items that we take care of. So I'm going to rewind the tape very far back. The first part of this presentation will be about how we got to the place we're at now, uh, then the formal studies, and then a little bit about how we use these uh, tools. It's always good to look at the past as a guide to the future. And here, um, around 1890, cameras were taking form, but simple things like f-stops were completely not standardized. So there were maybe a dozen different ways of describing the lens opening. Um, Albert Munsell, in 1901, patented a device, and by the way, he was a painter, uh, to sort of measure tone value, color. By 1904, the objective practices started taking hold. And, and I see that I'm not a photo historian, but I do collect things. And I noticed that one day, all my little light meters that I collected all had the same aperture scale. So somewhere between 1870 and 1904, the industry clicked together and they decided, we're going to do better if we standardize. It's also interesting to note that the Met Museum's photograph studio opened in 1906. So maybe at that time, photography moved from a curiosity to a business. And that business has grown. Uh, we have 13 full-time photographers, four full-time image editors, and five administrative staff. Um, we've always tried to take the highest quality photography. Um, and digital isn't the first transition. Uh, this is a picture of our cold storage vault. And you know we have every photographic process over the past 100 years in those vaults. So this is a constant change. Um, and basically, each technology shift presents new challenges. Um, you know, while the methods evolve, the goal of museum photography remains the same. So uh, another way of looking at this is here's what we all face. Since 1995, when the Met started doing digital, We've been through at least three generations of digital cameras, scanners, countless monitors, um, operating systems. And those little green boxes signify when there were times during that I can remember when everything actually worked. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually when um, the computer industry sort of does these uh, changes and upheavals and things start to click where the app operating system is in line with the Photoshop you're using and all that. Um, you'll also notice another thing is that our purchase patterns, if you look at the uh, post-September 11th drop-off in everything and then the rebuilding and then the next drop-off during the recession. Um, I bring this up because we're going to be, all be facing a huge uptick in our activities with new hardware and new technology coming in the next, you know, with the new Mac Pros, 4K screens. We're ready for another wave right now. So the timing of this is very good. 
this is a perfect example of what we're really uh, facing here. Sorry for that graphic. Oh, something went wrong with that. The, uh, in 1998, we photographed the unicorn tapestries. And uh, by 2003, uh, all those tools were completely obsolete. But luckily, we used objective targets, and we were just doing color management when that project happened. So we still have our faithful images. And you know, they translated pretty well on the screen. That's the uh, unfaded front of the unicorn tapestries against the, uh, or, I'm sorry, the faded front versus the unfaded back, which was the big thing here. So computers come and go, our, our perception remains the same. And I think that's a lot. Uh, underneath all these standards are some very basic principles. And one tool, believe it or not, survived the whole transition that I recall. This thing has existed before digital. It's sort of falling out of vogue now. They're hard to find it anymore. But uh, th this tool carried through all of those upheavals of all the technology. So let's go back how these uh, standards evolved. Um, I think we all are aware of the original um, study at RIT about uh, museum artwork reproduction. Is everyone aware of that study? OK. Um, that was sort of a, a signal um, that people started looking at what they were doing and saying, yeah, I think it could be improved. It didn't really tell you what to do to fix it, though, if you look back. And people were grumbling about that. They just said, you're all doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think all of us in the room, I, I think I've worked with a, a lot of you, uh, have um, taken an interest from that study in bending the curve. Um, at the Met Museum in particular, um, it changed the way we looked at our camera gear. When we were purchasing camera gear in the past, um, we would test equipment and visually assess what we were getting and zoom in and, well, this looks sharper. But then we started using more objective uh, methods. Uh, and in this case, you see the uh, different moray patterns of um, um, single and multi-shot cameras on fine lines, and all sorts of things like that color. But there really were no standards to say, is this better or is this acceptable? Um, what started happening then is uh, in the Rijksmuseum, they, they set out to build a new photo program from scratch. They looked to the Met's practices and started going in that direction. Um, but uh, something interesting happened there. Uh, Cecile Vanderharten, the new manager, said, I want to see how we look compared to other museums. So we invited a few colleagues to supply files that were uh, objectively captured. Um, and we ran them out on presses in Europe. And it was fascinating that everything worked great, actually. Um, and I have to say that the management of the Rijksmuseum uh, at that time, Jan Willem Seberg was the managing director, and he paid for all this testing. He paid for the press time just to allow his staff to see, to know. So while it wasn't a formal study, it informed a lot. Um, of course, across the park, the Van Gogh uh, was just doing, believe it or not, their first digital uh, the following year. And uh, this is where the metamorphose practices started forming up. Um, the metamorphos and phagi were born in libraries, and it was at the Van Gogh where the leap uh, occurred where we started using metamorphos and color management for paintings. Um, and again, we invited museums from around the world, um, all over the place, to sort of participate in this test. And we brought the printing to use US standards just to see if it was something special going on in Europe. The results were also good. Um, I think the people and everyone in this room have played an important role in this movement. And here you have uh, one of the key people was the woman with the red hair there, uh, is Marianne Pierboom. Um, she is the person who brought the metamorphose together with uh, museums, in my opinion. And you see Barbara Bridgers there, my boss. Uh, she's someone who really has pushed forward all these years. And all the vendors, there's Hans van Dormelen on the right there. Um, all these people working together. Um, with that success, we came back to the Met and we threw our hardest, most difficult paintings, things that just never reproduced properly in books, and once more, things worked really well. So when the RIT study came along, we decided, well, this is what we're pushing forward is, you know, metamorphose straight up, uh, no post-production, just right off the camera reproductions. Um, the more recent study is Robert Buckley's study, 
which is even more interesting in some ways because there's more institutions and real live artworks and targets. And these studies were completely independent. Uh, our efforts were all independent, um, but it started gelling up here. Um, and again, for the CIE study, we submitted just straight off the camera um, metamorphos like you, any of you saw yesterday, same, same procedure. I'm going to hand it over to Susan. Okay. Do you mind if we finish early today? <laughs> All right. So I'll start by saying I'm hurt that, that you think Bob's study is more interesting than mine. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe because it's still going on. I don't know. Not really. <laughs> OK. So. Um, this, the final report of this study came out in 2011. Um, it was, uh, but the, the study, as Chris Edwards pointed out yesterday in the best practices panel, was done in 2009. And what we were doing was looking at um, the, per the perceptual image quality um, achievable in um, the fine art reproduction workflows that were in use at the time. So, oh, that's me. <laughs> Thanks, Guy. All right, so our objectives were to see, to evaluate the workflows that were in use at the time, understand the image quality that was being obtained by them, try to find some objective met metrics that would predict um, the, the perceptual quality of the um, uh, image quality being achieved and provide some guidance for museums to follow um, so that they could more reliably get image quality that would be uh, perceived as, as high. So to do that, we conducted a number of experiments. They're <coughs> listed here. Um, for each of the experiments listed here, there is a separate um, publication, so you, there's a lot of detail available. Um, I'll, I'll give the, uh, the, our research website at the end, and all reports on all of these are, are available. So I'm not going to go into details on all of these. I'll be concentrating on uh, um, the two shown here, the impact of the workflow on the quality with and without the original present and um, the uh, efficacy of, of a digital printing workflow on fine art reproduction. So um, the testing involves sending around artwork to a number of participating cultural heritage institutions. Um, we had 17 participants. These are the pictorial targets that went around. Um, it, there's a couple of oil paintings there, a watercolor in the upper right, um, an aquatint in the upper left, and in the <coughs> lower left, a, fo a photograph. And um, which of these do you think was the most problematic? The photograph. The photograph. <laughs> so, um, I, I heard yesterday talk about well we had a we had a small we kept our stuff to small gamut. Well, the gamut of that is is pretty small. However, it's really difficult to accurately reproduce because the materials used in a photograph are highly metameric to the inks or the um, the lights used in a in a electronic display. So metameric. Um, for those who aren't familiar with that term, means that when the light source changes, if the underlying um, uh, color curves for, of the pigments of the materials used are different, they'll look different. So if you match them under one light and then you change the light source, they won't match anymore. And that, um, that photograph, if, if you change the light source even a little bit, they look different. So that was a really hard, in fact, at, at the Met, we, mm -hmm. we um, the Met was kind of hurt because theirs didn't look so great. So, and then we changed the light booth and they looked great. So just a change in a D50 light booth was enough to change the rankings of, of the um, images that we got back. So 
if somebody tells, tells you, oh, what you're doing is easy, then, you know, I've got data that says <laughs> no, not so much. So we also sent around objective targets um, for, uh, to be photographed as well so that we could come up with um, objective measures as to what it is that would predict uh, the perceived image quality. So um, it, the target on the left is uh, the color target from um, image engineering, which is similar to the golden thread target that some of you might be familiar with. Um, the standard 24 patch color checker and the, uh, um, the one on the top right is a um, uh, patches of the pigments used in generating the oil paintings. So um, what happens if we used the um, patches of the actual uh, pigments that were used in generating the painting? So um, all the printing was done on the same press. The pre-press was done according to an ISO standard by the same person. Um, the presses were operated by the same person. Um, when guide prints were provided as part of the workflow um, that a cultural heritage institution used, um, all the matches to the guide prints were done by the same person. And um, for the digital part, the prints were made on an HP Indigo press. So we're trying to take out any of the variability that happened after um, the files were delivered to us. So same paper, same people doing the work, same press. Um, so for the perceptual testing, in the hard copy testing um, followed a rank order protocol. So of the reproductions that we had, our observers um, put them in order from the best match to the, um, or reproduction or representation of the original to the worst. Um, when the original was not present, it was their most preferred to their least preferred. And um, the observers were asked where in that order um, the reproductions went from being acceptable to unacceptable. So um, the soft copy testing um, followed a paired comparison protocol. So there were just two on the screen. And the observer was asked to uh, select the best reproduction of the original if it was present or their most preferred when it was not. OK, the people who participated in this um, were people across the range of, of those involved in fine art reproduction from fine art photographers to um, curators, art historians, librarians, and a few of the RIT students and staff. And the clip art for the RIT <laughs> students, so it's the little finger painting guy on the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and I mentioned that um, I, in the hard copy test, I asked um, the observers to, to tell us when they went from acceptable to unacceptable. And uh, um, that ranged a lot from one of uh, our art history teachers who said, oh, all of these look close enough to what I'm talking about that they'll work to the um, a conservator who didn't like anything. All right, so the key findings um, from those tests were that um, the guide prints provided um, little um, advantage um, to not having them. In fact, they <coughs> it was probably worse because it uh, we were uh, making these adjustments on press so that involved a lot of extra time and money to get um, a match to the guide prints, which then in the, in the perceptual testing um, showed it wasn't worth that time and money. So um, I think in the end, we're recommending that if you want to use guide prints, it should be truly a guide to just a suggestion that it should look like this, and if it doesn't stop and contact me, 
don't, don't have people try to match that guide print, because if it's not looking close to it, there's probably something wrong. Um, the testing also showed that extensive visual adjustments were not particularly helpful. Um, our, our very best performer um, was doing visual adjustments, but the second best was not. So um, the best was spending hours getting each of the prints right. The, the second best was spending minutes. And in the end, they were, they were quite close. And the variability between the ones who were um, making uh, visual adjustments was um, much higher than the ones who were not. So the ones who were not doing visual adjustments were all average to above average, and the ones, our, our, our worst ones, were doing visual adjustments. So you can make things better, but you can make things a lot worse, too. So um, if you have a good workflow, there should, um, it can uh, help make those visual adjustments unnecessary. There are some things, like that photograph that I talked about, where some, some visual adjustment might be needed. But um, generally speaking, um, we found that you can get away without it. Um, the most important thing we found was maybe to use a target at cat to make sure you have the capture right. Um, there was one that uh, institution that did not have the capture right, and although they did a, um, very good uh, visual adjustments, they couldn't make up for, for, the, for the capture that was not right. And of the objective measures, the main one was getting the tone scale right. So we, had, we looked at um, tone scale, we looked at the delta E metric, which puts together lightness, um, chroma, and hue. And um, it's the lightness that matters. Even when we were measuring directly on the prints and comparing those to the originals, those delta E's did not predict as well um, the, the perceived visual quality as getting the tone scale right. So at capture. So even with the, <laughs> the physical artifact, measuring those delta E's was not as predictive as the tone scale. Get that tone scale right. And here are some examples of some tone scales that we had. Um, the, uh, the one at, at the top was one of our best performers. <coughs> the two on the bottom in the hard copy study were somewhere in the middle. But the one on the left, people um, hated on the electronic display. <coughs> the blacks are lost. The, um, the one on the right, people loved on the electronic display because um, it had good blacks. So, um, so I'll, um, generally, the, the soft copy and hard copy had simil similar results for the reproduction assessment, but for the preference assessment, um, the soft copy results were different from hard copy. And so, um, and they were different between when the original was present and when it was not on the electronic display. So, okay, this is what I just said. Um, the results were consistent, hard copy to soft copy with the original present, um, not so much when it was not. And people liked uh, a higher contrast image on the electronic display. Um, the other um, important result is the digital press results were, um, uh, it was possible to achieve uh, um, acceptable results with the dis digital press. So it mattered, the workflow mattered more than whether they were digital or offset lithography. So um, if uh, the standard protocol was, was followed, uh, the digital press was able to produce perfectly acceptable results. So this would be a, an important result for print on demand, that this is something that's possible. Um, we did a um, short experiment as well in the web environment. So basically, we were um, reproducing the, the test we did in the lab without the original present um, on the web. So this is 
It's the same paired comparison protocol. We asked people to click on the image they liked better. We did a little color management check to see whether their um, display was color managed through the browser that they were using. Sometimes they were, sometimes they weren't. We had them uh, click on the area that was of most interest in making their decisions. Um, these are some of the results. So we see a lot of attention to faces when they're present. And the results show that, um, uh, that our web results agreed quite well with our results when the original was not present in the lab, but didn't agree at all with the results when the original was present. So much like our results with and without the original didn't agree, the same thing happened on the web. So basically, if um, we want to do testing where the original is not present, um, using uh, a web test is acceptable, even though um, uh, we found that our, our the systems that people were using for this experiment were not color managed always. And we have a question here. Uh, yes, when you say that you're inquiring online for them to pick their preference, could you tell us something about the verbiage that you're selecting there as to whether or not, for instance, you're asking which picture do you think is prettier, which one would you have done, or which one do you think is more like you think this artist did this painting? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, the, the question was simply, which <laughs> image do you prefer? Is that still live? It might be. There, it it was an it. amazing process that, for someone who cares about images, it was nightmarish to go through. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know, has, have, have anyone, has anyone done that test online? Yeah. And it, wasn't it crazy? <laughs> anyway, it went on forever. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Mm. No, in a good way. <laughs> so basically, if if there's a, if we're not looking at reproduction, but at preference, a web-based experiment is a reasonable approach. So some key findings from the project, and these are all in the in the uh, uh, final report, which is available on our website. Um, I'll concentrate on these as ones that um, matter in the question of standards and fine art reproduction. Um, again, we're um, recommending the use of uh, a target at capture to ensure that the capture is prop properly set up. Um, because manual post-processing cannot overcome entirely a poor capture. Um, if we followed standard workflows and ISO printing standards, um, it substantially reduced and in some cases eliminated the need for manual post-processing. And I've said those three throughout this presentation. I did not say um, that camera make and file format had little impact on our ranking results. So the, the highest ranked and the lowest ranked, I think, used the same camera. Um, most use the same file format. Um, one institution sent us their results in th three different uh, file formats that we evaluated, and there was little difference between those. Um, no significant difference in their, the ranking results between those three. So, um, so overall, in terms of the perceived image quality, um, getting the uh, tone scale right at capture is the most important thing. Um, and some, some other things to keep in mind, uh, the, the lighting conditions will have a strong impact on the image appearance. And um, for materials like um, the photograph and uh, <coughs> cobalt blue paint, um, changing the light source, is, is, a, is a problem. There was one oil painting which we ended up not sending out to the institutions because it was just too pathological, where we put cobalt blue mixed together with, I think, aquamarine, and it was just not possible to get that to reproduce um, uh, in an acceptable manner. <laughs> so, 
Cobalt blue is a tough one because the camera doesn't see it the way our eyes do. All right, and um, this work was supported by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, so thanks to them. And then on to Rob Buckley. Rob Buckley, uh, <laughs> let's switch. And I think I owe you some clarifications. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, um, you know, I think there's a sequence of this movement, and that's I'm hoping to get across in the presentation by bringing all these things together under one roof for probably the final time, first and final time, um, I hope, uh, that there's a progression. And all these studies and efforts were going on by all of us sort of simultaneously all around the world. And um, the CIE study was actually concocted at the symposium mm -hmm. of the RIT effort. And uh, it was sort of a, a validation of what uh, people were doing on top of an already successful validation. Um, so it was interesting to see that uh, I don't think the Met Museum would have adopted so quickly these protocols if it were not vetted externally, because it was at the time I was a consultant saying, I think we should do this, I think we should do this. It's hard to bend the curve and get management to be secure that you know one consultant's going to change the whole thing, um, and you know. But when multiple voices come and formal studies come, it really makes it happen. So while we were doing it for a long time, we needed this external validation to happen, uh, the science. So Robert's uh, take on this is interesting only because you have to put it in sequence after the RIT um, work that you'll see more museums coming tighter together. And I guess that's what I'm looking at, so. It's just teasing. Yeah, well, but no, but it's, it's an interesting comment I'm because we're all in it. Well, I oh. regret not being there in person to present. I am glad Scott and I were able to work out a way that I could give this presentation as part of the session he's put together on standards for artwork reproduction. Today I'm going to talk about the results from a multi-institution study we've conducted of image capture methods and coloring coatings. The study was undertaken by the CIE Committee on Archival Color Imaging, which I chair, working in collaboration with Steve Pooley at the Library of Congress, who leads the Still Image Working Group of the Federal Agency's Digitization Guidelines Initiative, or FAGI. I will describe our results to date about the job that different institutions do in capturing and digitizing color materials, with an emphasis on the color accuracy of the digitization process. Then I will share with you our observations and conclusions. Now, usually acknowledgments come at the end of a presentation, but I want to recognize up front the people who have made significant contributions to the study. The people listed here have contributed ideas, suggestions, materials, software, and facilities that have helped shape and advance the study. And of course, there are the participating institutions themselves. Altogether, the 17 institutions listed here participated in the study. Among them are libraries, archives, and museums, all with internal studios, as well as an external vendor who provides digitization services to multiple clients. Some use more than one capture method, so we ended up comparing about two dozen capture methods from these 17 institutions. These are all examples of artwork which can lead to rendered or reproduced images, such as the one shown on this slide. When starting with objects such as a statue or a photographic negative, there is a great deal of scope for interpretation when reproducing or producing an image of or from the object, illustrated by the images on the left here. The objects depicted on the right, including a map, manuscript page, and an albumin print, are images already rendered on some medium, so there's less room for interpretation and a narrower idea of what it means to faithfully reproduce them, and in particular, the color content. This study has focused on the type of originals on the right-hand side of this slide. Now, this is a simple illustration of the digital workflow that starts with a capture of an object, such as a print, and leads to reproduction, such as a catalog page, newspaper photo, or a web page. For each reproduction medium, there's a different path, taking into account the properties of the medium, such as the inks, substrate, and dynamic range, the viewing conditions, and in general, the goals of the reproduction. 
As a rule, it is desirable to defer these media independent decisions to as late as possible in the workflow. It's in this context that we talk about a use neutral digital master. It is an accurate representation of the original that preserves its salient features and with them the capability to reproduce the image on any one of a range of media. It is a starting point for cross media reproduction and for different rendering paths for different reproduction media and use cases. While some institutions may archive display rendered images, others archive images that can serve as common and neutral starting points for subsequent media and organizational specific rendering choices. A use neutral archival master also suggests an institution neutral archival master, which would enable sharing and production of archival masters across institutions. With that, let me introduce CIE TC 809, which is Technical mm -hmm. Committee 9 on Archival Color Imaging and CIE Division 8 on Imaging Technology. The <coughs> committee has members from eight countries and collaborates with the Federal Agency's Digitization Guidelines Initiative, in particular the Still Image Working Group. Its terms of reference are given here. To recommend a set of techniques for the accurate capture, encoding, and long-term preservation of color descriptions of digital images that are either born digital or the result of digitizing two-dimensional static physical objects, including documents, maps, photographic materials, and paintings. This notion of a use-neutral master is implicit here in the terms of reference of the committee, which mention capture, but not reproduction. This implies a focus on input or original referred color encodings rather than output referred ones. The current focus of the committee is a multi-institution study of image capture methodologies and color encodings. The goal of the study is to assess the color accuracy of different color capture and encoding approaches with a view to establishing a knowledge base and set of techniques. Institutions can refer to this knowledge base to find out how they're doing and if they want to improve this aspect of their performance, what it would take in terms of resources. How well an institution does, and this is only one measure, although a significant one of performance, depends on several factors, budget, schedule, equipment, and training. Even if a single approach were demonstrated to be able to give the best color accuracy and the smallest difference between the original and captured color values, there is still a cost associated with increased color accuracy. Practitioners are more interested in a cost-benefit analysis that will allow them to make an informed choice on a color capture methodology based on their particular mix of skills, budget, equipment, materials, and schedule. This study is intended to describe the accuracy cost trade-off so that an institution will be in a position to confirm or select a performance point on the curve that meets their requirements and constraints with an awareness of the cost accuracy benefits and trade-offs that that point represents. The materials for the study consisted of three targets that are commercially available and four sample prints that are representative of the materials within scope for the committee. The four types of prints include a hand-colored photogravure, a hand-colored etching, an albumin print, and a chromogenic print. For each sample print, there was a mask or a sleeve with cutouts that isolated small regions of interest, or ROIs, with approximately uniform color that was representative of the colors in the print. This slide shows print D, the chromogenic print, with and without its mask. The prints in general had between five and 12 of these regions of interest or cutouts in their, in their sleeves. The assembled package of study materials was passed from one participating institution to the next. Each institution was asked to capture the three targets and four sample prints, both with and without their masks, using their existing color image capture methodology. They then provided TIF files with the captured RGB values for our analysis. We compared the color values of the test target patches and the print ROIs from the capture files with the values we measured using a spectral photometer. The measured values represent the color capture aim points. In effect, we were testing how well a capture system comprising a camera, planetary scanner, or flatbed scanner with the associated setup and processing software <coughs> emulated a spectrophotometer. Very much an industrial approach. 
but not so unusual when you consider that many calibration tools use targets that were in the study. Some institutions use the metamorphose or FAGI guidelines, although that was not a requirement. And besides providing image files, this institution was also asked to fill out an online form with questions about their capture methodology. The TIF files we received from the participating institutions contained calibrated RHV values tagged with an ICC display profile. The ICC display profile, which is functionally equivalent to an ICC input profile, contains the parameters that would be used in a subsequent step in an ICC workflow to convert the calibrated RHV values to XYZ values in the ICC profile connection space, or PCS. Most institutions use Adobe RGB 1998 as a calibrated RGB color space or color encoding. The next most common choice was ECI RGB version 2. Both have similar gamuts. One institution used Profoto RGB, which has a wider gamut, and another used CIE RGB. There was also one institution whose file did not contain an ICC profile at all. In this case, we assumed that the file contained sRGB image data. We also received files with both 24-bit and 48-bit RGB values. Now, one factor in selecting a color encoding is to have one large enough, with a gamut large enough, to contain all the expected colors without resorting to clipping values or desaturating colors to bring them within range that the encoding supports. This chart starts off with all the patches on the x right Digital Color Checker SG chart. This shows the patches in the chart that are outside the gamut of sRGB and therefore ones that sRGB is incapable of accurately representing. Quite a few as you can see. With Adobe RGB 1998 or ECRGB version 2, only a few colors, the ones in particular on the right, are out of gamut. All patches on this chart... No, sorry. This just came in like minutes before our presentation. Well. Now, I one can't. factor in selecting a color <laughs> encoding is to have again, one large enough, with a gamut large enough, to contain all the expected colors without resorting to clipping values or desaturating colors to bring them within range that the encoding supports. This chart starts off with all the patches on the x right Digital Color Checker SG chart. This shows the patches in the chart that are outside the gamut of sRGB and therefore ones that sRGB is incapable of accurately representing. Quite a few as you can see. With Adobe RGB 1998 or ECRGB version 2, only a few colors, the ones in particular on the right, are out of gamut. All patches on this chart are within gamut for Profoto RGB. Sorry about that. Well, many of the digital color checker SG patches are outside the sRGB gamut, it turns out that all of the print ROIs are within it, as shown here on an XY chromaticity diagram, which plots them with the gamuts of sRGB and the other color spaces or encodings. Other sample prints with other ROIs would likely have values outside the sRGB gamut. The goal of encoding is usually expressed as being one that's just large enough to cover the target color set so that the encoding precision is high, especially when you're using 8 bits. With wider gamut spaces, the sentiment is that more bits are needed to avoid contouring due to coarse quantization and therefore less accurate encoding of the color values. Besides providing TIFF files with calibrated RGB values, most institutions also filled out an online form about their capture methodology. They described things such as the make and model of the capture device, their calibration procedure and setup, capture settings, light source, post-capture image processing use, if any, and the intended purpose and use of the captured images. Shown here is the response from one institution that happened to follow the FAGI guidelines. Other institutions followed the metamorphosa guidelines. Using one or the other was not a requirement, and institutions were not asked to do anything different from what they do now for image capture. 
Now here are some results. This plot shows the average delta E or difference between the measured and captured color values plotted against the maximum difference. The differences we're calculating is using the CIE DE2000 formula. One data point corresponds to one capture method, and the color of the data point indicates the color encoding used by that institution, or that capture method. Institutions are identified by a number, in some cases followed by a letter A or B if they use two different capture methods. And some institutions were also assigned two numbers. Now the plot shows a correlation between the maximum and average errors. In the next round of analysis, we are planning to plot the 90th percentile versus the median error values as well. Now you'll notice that the ECI RGB version 2 and Adobe RGB clusters overlap. Although the institutions with the smallest errors happen to use an, R, I'm sorry, an ECI RGB version 2 encoding. More on that later. Overall though, the differences between the institutions are not that great. Most like between 1 and 5 on the horizontal axis. This seems remarkable when you consider the range of devices, lighting arrangements, and software used by the participating institutions. This plot is analogous uh -huh. to the previous one. It shows <laughs> maximum versus average errors for the ROIs on print A, the hand color. I'll try to bring that up later, print. sorry. The correlation between the maximum and average values is not as strong as it was on the previous plot. And there still is an overlap between the ECI RGB version 2 and Adobe RGB clusters. Color difference in the last three plots was the combination of the lightness, U, and chroma differences between the samples. We decided to take a closer look at the lightness, or L star, values. This plot compares the captured and measured lightness values for the two rows of grayscale patches at the center of the digital color checker SG chart. The aim for accurate capture is the straight line at 45 degrees through the origin. If the lightness value in the original is accurately captured, then the points in the plot would all lie on this line. For the captures from the institution shown here, the points are close to the line for the lighter patches and at higher lightness values. Where we see deviation is for the darker patches and at lower lightness values. This has the effect of increasing the contrast in the darker part of the tone scale. In one case, the darkest patch is pegged at a minimum uh, RGB value of zero. So what do these captures actually look like? This slide shows a screen capture from Adobe Photoshop of two different regions in the print A images from three different institutions. As you go from left to right, the images have higher contrast and look richer. Also, as you go from left to right, the capture values are less accurate and less faithful to the original. The general observation is that an accurately captured image looks somewhat washed out in typical viewing situations. The tone curve for accurate capture is simply not the same as the tone curve for pleasing or preferred reproduction. As a result, there are some who capture and store images that give pleasing reproductions on a monitor. They may not be use neutral, but they are ready to use as is and do not need any further processing for their main use case, which is monitor display. Let me conclude now with the observations we made on the data so far and the conclusions that we've drawn. First, a well calibrated and color managed approach has the benefit of more accurate color and less variability. Not a surprise, but a well calibrated and color managed approach does require an investment in skills, equipment, and software. While we saw some differences in performance with the captured device and color encoding, the conclusion we drew is not that ECI RGB version 2 is a more accurate color encoding, it's that the institutions who happen to use ECI RGB version 2 do more accurate color capture. One institution took the same capture and encoded using ECI RGB version 2, Adobe RGB, and Profoto RGB. They showed that there was little difference in accuracy between the three. What difference there was was due to the transformations applied to the calibration step, not due to the color coatings. Finally, with the results shown for the selected ROIs in prints A and D, we saw that color capture can be very accurate for small gamut originals using wide gamut color spaces such as ECI RGB version 2 and Adobe RGB. We also saw little difference in accuracy between 24-bit and 48-bit encodings. 
Now, a goal of the study, of this multi-institutional study, is a knowledge base and set of techniques which an institution can reference to either select or confirm their approach to color capture. Best practices, if you like. These practices include specifying the processes for both capture and assessment. The institution itself has to decide on the aim points and level of performance that is most compatible with its goals and capabilities. Color accuracy in capture, or delta E, is a function of an institution's resources and approach. What institutions want to know is how well they are doing compared to their peers and what it would take and what it would cost to improve their performance. Finally, a reminder that we have focused on accurate capture. The value of accurate capture seems obvious. When materials such as historic documents, prints and photographs are scanned to provide digital circuits for scholarly study, online access, or preservation, it is important to capture the properties of the object, including its color or spectral content, so that they are faithful to the original and have the capability to support the intended use cases, which can include reproduction on a wide range of media. When it comes time to reproduce the master, either in print, on a display, or on some other medium or material, further processing is required. The tone curve is one of the important determiners of reproduction quality, and the tone curve for pleasing reproduction is different than the tone curve for accurate capture. I wish I could be there for the rest of the session and for the discussion. Best wishes to you all for the remainder of the conference. Thank you. Bye, Rob. Uh, I will, at the end, I'll find those um, graphs because that's sort of like the meat of his whole thing. Sorry about that. But um, I'm glad that Rob really, he was, I, I, the file came in at one in the morning. Uh, I was asleep with the audio. And um, um, when I brought it in, there was no audio. So he actually redid the thing this morning uh, and sent it to me. So it's just the way things go. Um, at least Rob has a calming voice. I wanted to sort of segue into, okay, you know, okay, these studies say this is the case. How do we actually practice this? And there were questions yesterday about paintings and works on paper and all this. And uh, one thing is that the metamorphose in FADGI protocols, and to some extent the studies were mostly based on two-dimensional objects. The metamorphose in FADGI were born out of the library space. The studies included some paintings. Um, but this is what Robert was saying about um, color gamut. Uh, this is our SG chart that most people are using. Uh, and these are the colors that are clipped in all of the spaces. Uh, by the way, Adobe RGB is not an ISO standard. Uh, Profoto is a standard as called RIM RGB. Uh, ECI is a ISO technical specification. And sRGB, I believe, is an ISO standard. Um, that's one thing to keep in mind here. We, we, we didn't develop ECI, uh, Adobe RGB for a particular purpose like museum imaging. Um, but I like to look at the real world. Uh, so real world color is where it's at in terms of the things we photograph. So at the Met, we, we prefer to be able to use the same encoding for all of our work. Um, and in this case, uh, how do we know what, what is the right encoding? So what we did here is we took our sample sets from various tests in the past, and then one day one of our photographers had a uh, um, that that work on the right, which is uh, very saturated, and, and I've been clamoring to find a piece of art that actually had more gamut than the SG, and I finally found one. Um, and you'll see this is a Profoto RGB. And these are all the colors that you're seeing splayed out are all the colors of that file. Um, here's ECI RGB, and it pretty much contains all of that. Adobe does, in fact, clip, like Robert was saying, and the other charts show. Um, and that's not just the SG colors popping out. That's the colors, was that Matisse, I think, or the, the piece on jazz, I think it's, it's called? Yeah, that, that uh, bottom right there. The blue, the yellow, and the red are very pure. And then there's your sRGB. So that's another way of looking at what Rob was talking about. Um, I'm going to go through this very fast. The, uh, we're, we're pretty aware of these two protocols. But it's important to point out that they both point to ISO standards for their various technical aspects. They're different methods to arrive at the same, um, well, definitions of quality. Um, 
they both use technical targets. More importantly, they're a sign of the maturing technology in that we need to push back against the industry to have better quality out of the box. Uh, they really give us the ability to control our quality and interchange files. And, and most importantly, ISO is working to bring these two together um, because generally uh, I'm finding uh, personally that the adoptance curve has swung very heavily towards metamorphose, uh, but not in terms of the targets we use and the tools we use to validate, but just the fact that they're very specific protocols. Um, people like that idea of passing or failing something, um, but not everyone meets metamorphose that uses it. I, mean, I think the tendency is to sort of flatten these things to one protocol, one chart system, you know, definition. And that's what's going on in ISO. Because we really don't need two ways to do the same thing. If you look at printing, you have ISO uh, printing and G7 printing. And in some ways, it's sort of silly because they both point to the same ISO charts. So here's the process of using um, that you saw yesterday. We photograph a chart and then we validate that capture. Typically, if you take a camera out of the box, you fail. And here, uh, when we talk about metamorphose and FAGI being very similar, one uses delta E76 calculation, and uh, FAGI currently uses a delta E2000 calculation. Um, what's interesting here is if you, uh, the takeaway here is if you calibrate your system and get a FAGI four-star pass within the tolerances on the right, you may not hit the metamorphose, which are a little tighter. But if you go the other way around, you'll always, if you get to the metamorphose, you'll always get FAGI for free. And I think that's pretty accurate. Is that accurate? Yeah. I, don't, okay. I don't see that reflected in the numbers. Could you perhaps explain that okay. differently? Um, like can, can I answer that? Yeah, uh, maybe oh. Susan. Um, um, I can answer that. The uh, delta E2000 is a smaller number than delta E76, so they're not directly comparable. Yeah, that's, I'm sorry about that. I'm so close to it sometimes. But when you see less than three values, it's a different scaling. So, but it always goes, I've always found just for practical purposes, if you reach that metamorphose, you'll get, you'll pass the delta E2000. I've never been able to not do that. But going the other way, I don't always get it to pass metamorphose. It's, it's roughly, uh, I think, 1.8 times uh, to get delta E76, it's roughly 1.8 times uh, um, delta E2000, but it's not the same for every color. So it's a, but just uh, as a rough estimate. Um, while you're here, because we have an expert in the house, I've, I've always understood it to be that the 2000 has sort of variable numbers based on colors that we may not perceive as different versus the. the, the um, Delta E2000 uh, came out of the fact that Delta E76 um, doesn't produce uniform, formally per, um, perceptible color difference. So a, a color difference of one in the red is not necessarily the same as a color difference of one in the blue. And it's the blue that was the problem child. So um, the Delta E2000 straightens out the blue area. So it's a little delta E2000, um, a difference of one in one area is more um, consistent with one in another area. So it's more uniform, but they are smaller. The bottom line is both of these, you know, when you calibrate your camera, the goal is to get it validated. Um, the, this example, I think, is the real world part that I wanted to share. Uh, and it's very fresh. This is something that's really going on in the museum. Um, the image here uh, that you're looking at um, is split because the left image was photographed in our painting conservation lab with a uh, Canon's 5D uh, tungsten lights, just two bare total lights, and capture one. And we, uh, our goal was to bring these cameras together because we have this issue of um, the photograph studio shoots the pre and post conservation and the conservation lab shoots ongoing work throughout the conservation process. So um, this passed metamorphose. We actually had to change our software and work hard to get it to pass. Um, but then on the right was the validation of the uh, Hasselblad in our studio. And I think it's uh, 
the Canon is two point something delta E's and the Hasselblad is like 1.5 or, or so. Uh, and as to Chris Edwards' discussion yesterday, you see that little patch that looks red? It's actually orange, it's near popping out, it's like eight or nine. Um, 10 is the threshold on metamorphos. Well, basically, that says there's something else going on because you can't have a chart under tungsten light with a cannon and another chart, you know, the same exact chart under a Hasselblad with flash and have that kind of correlation. So that means there's something, either my chart's faded or it's not accurate to the reference data. So it's important when you get into this stuff to realize these are all just guides. But the visual is important, you know, validating that out of it. So here, uh, we like to sort of validate the validation. So we take our I1 and we measure the surface of the uh, painting. And then you can see, I love that transition as you see those color samples drop into that Photoshop file. And that's when you know you really have something going on because you, know, you can talk all you want about charts and, and um, tolerances, but when you start taking the actual colors in, including them, it's just great. So this is really something we should do more. If you have ever any questions about if this is working, if you have a color that doesn't work right, having those spectral measurements allows you to literally refer to them when you go to solve output problems because you can pick up that red and print it on your printer and you'll see you'll have much greater delta E shifts from that observer referred file to the output. So, long story short. Here's where we are in our workflow. That becomes the master image. Then, um, okay, now it's in the pool for the museum to share. Um, well, uh, the first thing I started doing at the, the museum when I came on board was uh, running through the museum calibrating. And we've been calibrating um, um, with our ice and tea department and the photograph studio. So they've helped us uh, work on vetting equipment, so we don't buy equipment now that doesn't calibrate well. Um, before it was just based on cost, uh, you know, especially on the PC side, they just take the $200 screen. We found that you can get a two or $300 screen working beautifully and pass these uh, you know, pretty tight protocols. The screens have gotten so much better. But I've calibrated over 200 displays throughout the museum in the past year. Um, and it's actually fun, people are so excited, you know, that same feeling of Yes, I'm calibrated, finally. Um, and uh, we've actually gone to L-Star calibration for everything but digital media um, because I, I'm just a firm believer in this sort of, until we know what the output is, it, it, it feels just great to keep everything lockstep with that original source. Now that we have stored and can visualize a file in a calibrated system, uh, now we talk about output. Well, there are standards for output, and we can utilize those standards. So let's say between our graphics department, uh, editorial, and uh, um, office services, there's a printing press in the basement of the Met. So all of these tools, we're working towards bringing them together, in-house as well as for vendors. <coughs> And we didn't have to reinvent those standards, we just had to start using them across the whole organization. Um, laser printers, those could be challenging. Um, there really are no protocols for desktop lasers, but you could try to hit, you know, CMYK press standards, but, you know, they vary a lot. Um, there are standards for going to broadcast, there are standards for going to the web. Um, you know, in, in most workflows, you're converting somewhere to sRGB from your master image. Um, over this past summer, we published, we captured and produced over 50,000 images for our Met Images uh, 82nd and 5th campaign, I'm sorry. Um, and those all flowed through beautifully from the source space to the destination. Then. The longer term goal is to bring all devices through ICC, through this process, not just for books and paper, for everything. Um, but here's where it gets interesting in the real world, is with ICC and standardized workflow, all of these standards exist, but if we lose, if that chain breaks, all hell breaks loose. If, if you're 
TMS system strips the profile off of the file. You've just dropped all of that value. Um, and I wish in this uh, conference there was a big group where we can get all the web people to see this because the, the people that do the backend systems need to know when they specify systems, it needs to be ICC compliant. Um, and here's an exa a real world example. This is a problem we had to solve early on. Um, the Rembrandt database, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but there's been this effort to bring together all the images of the Rembrandts. Um, the Met supplied what they wanted was the master file. And in, in, in this case, our master file is a well-calibrated pro photo RGB encoded file. And normally when you download from our system uh, for use, it'll convert it to a lower res JPEG sRGB. Um, but in this case, they wanted the master and they got it. And so they threw it in their system and uh, I started seeing emailings flying around the museum about this. Someone's unhappy at the, the project there. And you know, right away we looked at our file and we can see on their website that the color's been sucked out of those targets, which is the only value of having those targets. Um, so I got in touch with them and they were very open to let, like digging further with this. So we basically took a set of synthetic charts like the, the values of the SG turned into files in those different working spaces and all of those test files that we've collected into a sort of test strip. And um, what you do is you basically take those synthetic files and you analyze them against themselves and you get something you've never seen, the perfect green. <laughs> but re remember, each one is different. That's why there's four, because of the different gamuts. But now, now that I know those are perfect and I can analyze them, I sent them over to the, um, uh, the this is right off of the uh, um, website of the Rembrandt database. And here you go on the same computer with Safari, uh, the sRGB, now none of these should have, well actually, if color management worked correctly, um, the sRGB images would have survived, because remember, how we analyze this is our screen is brought to sRGB validated state. And so there, that means that the, the ones that are bigger gamut would fail, but the sRGB ones should be all green. But Firefox, Safari, and uh, Firefox just changing the settings in Firefox changed the quality of the reproduction. Um, System 2 was interesting, my Mac Pro, um, Safari died, but notice I'm on 10.68 at the Met. Apple's done a lot of things to improve this over time, um, but Firefox set to the proper color mode worked perfectly. So that's an NEC calibrated monitor calibrated to sRGB, looking at the Rembrandt database of an sRGB file. Um, but there are sRGB files untagged. So when it goes into the Rembrandt database, the profile stripped. Um, this was interesting. People always ask, can you do color on a PC? And here you go. Here's uh, Internet Explorer on a Dell desktop, one of our lowest systems, and it worked. It came through fine. Um, when you look at this uh, image result, you'll see the varying degrees of purple in the uh, Matisse. Um, and if you look closely, there's a lot of other things that go wrong, but those saturated colors are the things that you see the most. So uh, there were three failure points identified in this analysis. First of all, the delivery of the pro photo versus converting down. Um, then somewhere along the way, the profile was stripped. And uh, the browsers actually, many of them support color, but it requires the profile to be embedded in the image. So any web initiative that strips profiles, that was popular in like the 90s when you were on dial-ups and they said, well, that's uh, 40K. Yeah, overhead, you know, and it, it just doesn't make sense anymore. You're actually losing so much more. And think of e-commerce, you know, think of buying things online. Um, so we could have delivered as an sRGB. Uh, the backend database should recognize the embedded tags. We did work with RKD and the, it was one um, tool that they used on their web to do the zooming was what blew the workflow. So they came in correctly and we converted to sRGB, they still failed. And what it was is that zoom tool didn't recognize color. It just assumed 
um, what was going on. Um, and again, at least calibrating to sRGB on your viewing system. And they work fine on our wide gamut high-end monitors as long as the profile path is kept. Um, so the web can be definitely color managed. It actually is color managed, uh, but it won't manage itself. Uh, we need to evaluate our systems. Uh, we need to support ICC and all the web-facing tools we, we purchase. Uh, that should be in the RFP. Uh, and uh, this method of validating your public-facing work is, um, is available. It's in an ISNT paper, uh, and it's really fascinating. In fact, I have to thank Chris uh, Edwards when we tried first using ECI, and we tried different things. We threw things into your systems, and we were like, whoa. You know, if you're worried about color space, that's not your problem. It's making sure your workflow is coherent, and I think everyone agrees with that. Um, so standards at the Met. Our goal um, is to sort of keep pushing out through the photo studio, help to all departments that need help coming into this loop. It, it really isn't um, uh, a one department at a time thing. We just keep pushing out the circle. And it's, it's been really fun, starting with low-hanging fruit monitor calibration, then scanners, We've gotten uh, past metamorphos on $200 Epson scanners. There's 100 Epson scanners in the Met. We've identified 25 that are actually used for important stuff. So we got a site license for the software and we set out to calibrate those 25. So the, all these things are doable even in a large institution. Um, this is the most exciting thing going on at the Met is that they've uh, in encouraged me to stay on board with the ISO discussions. And there's two important things here. One is that we have uh, the ISO effort to merge the metamorphos and the phagy, which is moving along at a, a, a slow pace, but it's moving along. And then the other one is on working group 18. Um, we're discussing this observer referred to imaging state, something to maybe help with the, uh, um, uh, our master files. Uh, we're talking about DNG standards which are sort of battling back and forth. It's, it's like the United Nations. It's very hard to describe, but it's, <laughs> it's completely opposite of what you would think uh, in the real world. But what was great about this ISO involvement was in the room here are representatives from Hewlett Packard, Microsoft, Adobe, Apple, Panasonic, Sony, Canon, Nikon, um, listening to this same presentation. So all those manufacturers are hearing your voices through this ISO engagement. Uh, and here's Joe Kosha, we were talking about 360, and you can tell these engineers are hobbyists as far as photography goes. I, I don't think many of them actually have shot art. <laughs> and, you know, we're engaged with the industry. Uh, all of these manufacturers and many more are constantly flowing through the studio, um, and we're working to push what we feel we need to be successful. Um, one interesting piece is this, uh, Munsell L-Star Grayscale is going to become available soon. It's probably going to start as a, we've literally had to kick it into a custom thing, um, but it'll ultimately be a product, I think, you know, over time. So this will become available maybe around the beginning of the year. And, you know, if you have a, a camera software that has L-Star readouts, if you want to do metamorphos or phagy, this is like the number one way to um, get moving along because the readouts match what you see on the computer. Uh, another thing we're working on is getting the, uh, with this type of thing, is getting the readouts on the camera histograms to match, you know, we have to shoot tethered to read out, but why can't we read out on the histogram of the camera L-star values so when we're shooting a painting in the field or in the gallery, we know what our exposure values are. Right now that just doesn't happen. And, and the companies are beginning to listen. Um, so uh, lastly, Adobe, which we've been, I've been publicly bashing for years, <laughs> um, Thomas Knoll came by, they kept bringing more people in, and this fellow Scott Fauché, who is their ISO liaison, is really pulling strings, and we uh, got the beta version of uh, Lightroom, which you can download from Adobe Labs, has an option to get L-Star readouts. We tried it just last week, and it immediately improved our workflow. They still don't support ICC profiles for some godforsaken reason, but um, the, they, I think they will if we keep pushing. But the fact that they added the L-Star readouts is a major, think about it, just a few museums 
screaming at them has gotten them to change features from this company that never listened in, in the past. Um, so we're still in pro RGB at the Met. We would really like to move to something else, but there's a lot of systems implications to doing that. A lot of things were actually built around Profoto. It has no negative impact on us, but uh, we're trying to move away from that gamma thing, the old fashioned 1.8, 2.2 to L-star. Um, and that may take some more ISO work to get going. But um, are we out of time? Oh, great, almost, yeah, oh, geez. So anyway. Um, the, uh, the idea of bringing the metamorphose through the museum, helping uh, the departments migrate to our objective standards like I showed you in the paintings conservation test, um, checking equipment and making sure everything we do going forward is, supports this, um, and encouraging the camera manufacturers. The results have been in the work. We've been able to basically move through work faster. This campaign was right at the point where we started really getting into the dialed in capture and this was the work of two days, one or two days of the photographers going after this very specialized campaign. Everything went through print, web and everything just perfectly. Um, and the bottom line is that helps get it to the public and you know through all channels and it's just really great to to be in the center of pushing that content out. Uh, and there's a lot of people to thank. Uh, we'll just sort of roll through. But these are people that I've directly interacted with over the years through all the various tests. And uh, a lot of people, you know, there's people that aren't on there. But I mean, this is just, uh, I'm trying to point out how many people have really been behind this movement when you look at these presentations. Uh, you know, and you know, the growing number of people that have sort of popped up. So thanks for listening. I know it's been a long thing with a, a couple technical errors. Uh, I don't know if you have to move on to another talk, but if there's any questions, if not, thank you.